276, um, organized by the Dynamic Coalition of Internet Rights and Principles, the Dynamic Coalition on Accessibility and Disability, and the Dynamic Coalition on Public Access through Libraries, a, a consortium of dynamic coalitions. My name is Robert Bodel, Professor of Communication and New Media Studies at the University of Mount St. Joseph and Miami University in Ohio, United States. And I've been active with uh, the IRP since 2008. This workshop sets out to address particular challenges for disadvantaged groups in enjoying a people-centered, inclusive, and development-oriented information society on the Internet and proposes ways of meeting these challenges in support of universal access, effective use, and specialized services for disadvantaged populations that include the physically disabled, non-technical and oral cultures, and the digitally disadvantaged within rural and remote communities. This workshop is part of a nexus of interrelated workshops building on the charter, charting the charter workshop that took place yesterday and feeds directly into the workshop tomorrow uh, toward the IRP Charter 2.0 Human Rights and Principles for the Internet in practice at 9 o'clock in Room 9. Uh, please come join us then as well. I'm very happy to introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, I'll start with Stuart Hamilton, Director of Policy and Advocacy at the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, IFLA, who will also co-moderate with me. Uh, next, I'd introduce Catherine Easton, a lecturer of law at Lancaster University, and her research interests include internet governance, domain name regulation, intellectual property, and access to technology and human computer interaction. On my right here is Konstantinos Komaitis, policy advisor at the Internet Society, focusing primarily on the field of digital content and intellectual property. Uh, to my left at the end, uh, Yulia Moronets uh, is uh, a member of the NGO Together Against Cybercrime. She's also an IGF MAG member uh, and focuses on access of marginalized groups at the European level. And on my far right, uh, Nadine Moawad, who is presenting in place of Jack Sim Key, uh, Association for, for Progressive Communications. And remotely is Jim Tobias, who is president of Inclusive Technologies, which provides free and paid consulting services to companies, public agencies, consumers, researchers, purchasers, and policymakers on how accessible and usable technologies can better meet the needs of all users, including users with disabilities and elders. And we have Deirdre Williams as our remote participation moderator. A quick word about the format of our session. Our per participants will be asked to make brief introductory statements indicating the context and circumstances for their own groups, focusing on specific cases and examples of how disability and or marginalization affect access and use of the Internet. And then we'll open it up to participants in the audience to answer directly pointed questions and comments to the panelists uh, who will answer immediately. Then we will close with a summary of recommendations, action points, and ways forward. So uh, I think we uh, should start with uh, Stuart Hamilton. Thank you, Robert. Um, so I'm here uh, representing the International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, or IFLA, um, which is really the global body representing libraries and their users. We have members in over 150 countries, and as you can imagine, um, there's quite a variety amongst our membership uh, of the types of libraries and the types of library users that we serve. Um, for example, we have some parts of the world where there are great networks of public libraries, uh, and yet quite significant parts of the world where the concept of the public library perhaps doesn't really exist at all. <coughs> um, libraries have already always existed to serve um, all of the groups in a community. So when we're thinking about sort of um, a people-centered internet for everybody, but in particularly for marginalized and vulnerable groups, libraries, I think, have a very, very important role to play. We're serving remote 
populations. We've been working quite closely recently with librarians in the Federated States of Micronesia, for example, where there are any number of issues relating to internet connectivity and access to information. We serve disadvantaged groups, um, and without wishing to be flippant, I think I could say something like, uh, you name them, we serve them. Um, at the moment, of course, one of the big disadvantaged groups that we serve would be, uh, let's just call it, the unemployed. We have a time of austerity. We have uh, a lot of work to do, particularly uh, we're finding at the moment in Europe by helping people use public libraries to find work uh, and jobs. We serve um, the visually impaired. We serve people with reading difficulties. We have a, a long and proud tradition of making available our services for those groups and for helping them out. And I know that Constantinus on my left will talk a little bit about some of the work that IFLA and other groups have been involved in to secure better information for those groups. Um, I think one of the things I just want to talk about very quickly in my opening statement would be, um, from a librarian's perspective, what are the, what are the elements of a human-centered internet and information society? And I think in some respects, I've got the easiest job by going first because I think I can just state for the record a respect for human rights. Um, Article 19 is one of the guiding principles of librarians worldwide, freedom of access to information, freedom of expression. We would want to see that front and center for any information society that looks at helping marginalized and disadvantaged groups. We firmly believe that there should be public access to ICTs uh, in the community so that everybody can benefit at free to very low cost. And uh, IFLA has been involved in an initiative called Beyond Access. Uh, you can find out more at beyondaccess.net, which uh, looks very closely at the role that public libraries can play in providing access in the community. With access comes training. Uh, media and information literacy will be a key element, uh, we believe, in any people-centered internet. And libraries, of course, have a long history of, of being able to provide this training at the community level. Uh, I think we also need to think uh, in flexible terms. I think sometimes when we're at the IGF and particularly when we're looking at new technologies and how they can help the marginalized and disadvantaged, um, very often the word mobile comes up as if it's going to solve everybody's problems. Um, I think we really need to be uh, aware of a, of a much bigger approach to this. We know, for example, through our research that uh, in South Africa, where there's a huge penetration of mobile phones, um, there is still a great deal of need for traditional PC access, for example, in order for people to get the information that they need. And we see that in other countries as well. Um, just quickly, a couple of other things I think I'd want to throw into the mix. Um, open access to things like government data so that we can actually help our marginalized groups become engaged in sort of civic participation processes, um, and engage more in the democratic processes in their countries, and access to accessible format technology. And again, I'm going to, to leave that to Konstantinos to talk about it. And then just quickly, how do we actually get around to making this happen? Well, from our perspective, we need more cross-sectoral uh, cooperation. Uh, we particularly want to see uh, a dynamic whereby governments and policymakers work with development organizations and practitioners and libraries to solve some of these problems because I think with those three groups together we're going to end up with quite a formidable partnership and already I can share information uh, through the Beyond Access program on how that's happening in countries like the Philippines, Georgia and Peru. Um, to finish I would suggest just one thing really um, which I, I, I keep thinking about in every single workshop. We're coming up with some great policy ideas within things like the IGF, within things like the Open Government Partnership, um, within WISIS, within even the post-2015 development framework. But unless these policies consider what we might call last mile delivery, bringing the benefits of the policies to the people in the community, then I don't feel that we're going to make much process, uh, progress and these things will remain just words on a page. So it will come as no surprise to you that I think that libraries can play a great and positive role in bringing the benefits of our wonderful new policies on these issues to the people in the community who need them most. Great. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, it seems like a natural progression uh, to now go to Konstantinos. Thank you. Uh, 
Hello, every, everyone, and thank you for the invitation. My name is Konstantinos Komaitis, and I am a policy advisor uh, at the Internet Society. So uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the Internet Society, uh, a non-governmental organization uh, that was established in 1992, uh, and one of its key uh, missions is to make sure that the Internet is accessible by everyone and that users around the world are able to um, engage uh, with the tools and the various platforms on the Internet uh, and be able and uh, reap all the benefits. That, of course, includes disadvantaged people and actually, more importantly, includes disadvantaged people because when we're talking about that the Internet has no barriers, we're not only referring to geographical barriers, we're also referring to barriers concerning uh, the, the ability of people to um, get access uh, to the medium. So accessibility is a key issue and uh, accessibility should be at this stage and uh, as we start discussing today those uh, issues, just bear in mind that accessibility is, uh, means no discrimination in terms of access at a very high level and also uh, issues of inclusiveness. Uh, and it's quite surprising and actually quite disappointing that we're in 2013 and we're still dealing with issues of disadvantaged people on the Internet. If there is one platform, if there is one tool where those barriers should be broken down and eliminated is the Internet because there is, uh, the, the technology behind the Internet really, really allows everybody to be able and engage. So uh, I think that Stuart touched upon those issues. There are very, uh, uh, various reasons why uh, we see this happening. There are issues of affordability. The Internet in some parts of the world is still extremely expensive, uh, and it's uh, expensive especially for uh, some um, uh, disadvantaged uh, people and minorities. There are also cultural issues. We don't really understand uh, what sort of, when we're talking about disadvantaged people, everybody has a very different understanding uh, and to, to, an to a certain extent we all agree, but we don't really know what their problems are. We don't really know what their culture, uh, where they're coming from and their cultural uh, um, issues that they have to face. The other one is availability. Stuart talked about uh, mobile. Yes, it is important and it is fantastic and we see mobile penetration in some parts of the world increasing, but mobile is not going to solve our problems. It's going to assist, certainly, but we definitely need to start uh, uh, providing and creating the infrastructure. And by infrastructure, I mean both physical, which will allow this access to the Internet, but also beyond that, uh, Many, many years ago, we were all very, very excited with a $100 uh, laptop that MIT was doing. This was a fantastic initiative that, uh, and a lot of hopes, if you, if you want, were built around this initiative. Uh, it moved to the extent that it could move, but then, due to lack of many reasons, including cooperation, it didn't continue. I happened to, uh, it was a couple of years ago that I was watching um, CNN, and they had a report on uh, how India is actually dealing with access to the Internet. And so in India, uh, in New Delhi, and it was the case study there, they had put up computers in major streets. And you could see 10-year-olds going there and playing with the Internet, accessing the Internet. And they were following those 10-year-olds over the course of two, three months, and their ability to connect over those months, their ability to grasp things was incredible. And before that, they were literally on the streets begging for money. So we really, really see that the Internet can be a remarkable tool for some people, for everybody, and especially for these people, to actually uh, become part of this global uh, village that we are all referring to. And last but certainly not least, there is a lack of awareness. And we need, and I'm very glad that we have initiatives like this and workshops like this, especially in this space where we have so many participants for, from different uh, stakeholder groups, because we need to raise awareness. We take for granted in many, many parts of the world, including the part of the world that I am, which is in Europe, that everybody gets access to the Internet. Even in Europe, there are people that do not have 
access to the internet because of what they considered or they're being classed, categorized, siloed as disadvantaged. And we really need to start looking beyond that. The internet is for everyone, and it should be for everyone. And especially for this category of people, I would think that we can expect wonderful things because they are really keen to engage. So I don't want to be all doom and gloom. Uh, I, I really think that on a positive note, we see increasingly various organizations uh, taking a step up uh, and doing things. Uh, we see it in the regulatory front is m less slower, but that's to be expected because regulation is always slower. The technical community has really stepped up, and I will talk about it later because uh, I don't want to monopolize my opening remarks now. But what is lacking is cooperation. And I, I, I believe and I hope that uh, in this uh, forum, uh, where multi-stakeholderism is celebrated, where we're promoting an inclusive model, we will actually try to bring all these initiatives together and try to um, uh, liaise and put them in sync because some of them are either detached or, uh, there are, uh, or the organizations involved are ignorant as to the tools that are out there. So especially, in the, uh, and that's, I will close with this, especially the technical community can provide a great deal of input to regulators and policy makers and can actually, uh, and to businesses who need to step up and provide the financial support for disadvantaged people to start getting online. Thank you. Thank you, Constantinos. That was terrific. Uh, now we have a natural progression uh, to Catherine Easton. Hi, I'm Catherine Easton. I'm um, a legal academic and researcher at Lancaster University in the UK. Okay, um, when Constantinus and Stuart have been talking there, there have been many wider issues raised, some to do with sort of physical access to an internet connection. I've got to say that the area that I look at specifically focuses on, in a regulatory sense, that the cold level. So what I look at basically is accessible design for disabled people. In this sense, what I'd like to say is that basically we have this sphere that is the internet, the world in which there's so much communication and unprecedented level of interaction. Now, taking it at a, at a, at a wide level, the notion of a disabling society, so a society that actually makes people disabled due to barriers that it sets down in design, was being discussed around the end of the 80s, yeah, in the 90s. This was before the huge growth in the internet and before the internet actually was seen as something so important in our everyday lives. In relation to that, I'd argue that the internet could have been the first purely inclusive environment and sphere for people to interact and, and to actually connect. However, this hasn't happened. People designed websites with, with frames, with pop-ups, with JavaScript that won't support the screen reading technology that's used, that won't support accessible technology that needs um, st large hotspots, that won't support accessible uh, technology. So what have I started to look at? Started to look at, from a legal perspective, discrimination, anti-discrimination statutes, to find that actually the laws are there. In, in 2001, there was a large case you may be aware of, of, of Maguire and the Sydney Organising Committee for the Olympic Games. What happened was the website supporting the Paralympics was not actually accessible to disabled people. The Australian Human Rights Commission fined the Organising Committee of the Olympic Games um, quite a large sum of money. And throughout the case, they said, we can't actually make this accessible. It would be too much money to do so. An expert testimony said, no, actually, it would be easy to make this website accessible, and it would have been easier if you'd thought about this from the outset, instead of retrofitting, instead of changing the design, if you'd thought about your end user to be inclusive, to support universal access from the outset, then it would have been easy to design this website inclusively. So we had that. That was in 2001. 
a recent EU report stated that across the European Union in private sector sites, there's 34% uh, compliance with um, accepted accessibility standards. Um, and in public sector provided sites, so in e-government sites as well, there was about 44% of compliance. So actually, the public sector, the governments of EU member states, the European Union itself, aren't providing accessible websites, even though their laws mandate this. Okay. To, yeah. So, what's the difference here? Why, why is this happening? What I'm fascinated to look at is the difference between the actual substance of the law and the reality of inaccessible design. Quite a few different themes come out. One would be standardization. We now have the the Web Contact accessibility, Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are moving to, which are now an, internet, uh, an international standard. They have been developed through a process um, followed by the W3C. Now, this process might be criticized in some way, but I believe that it's a very positive move that the standards are now being seen as the actual ideal standard for accessibility. Another area that we look at is the public-private divide in relation to accessibility. We have governments that are trying to move more and more of their services online. I and mean, particularly in the UK, we're now focusing on a government that says it would be digital by default, trying to get people to apply for their benefits, to interact with the government online. But actually, a lot of these sites aren't fully accessible to disabled users. And finally, we have the international level that I like to look at. So the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the UN Convention, actually specifically enshrines a right in its Article 9 to accessible technology. Now, the way in which this convention actually sits and interacts with governments and its, its signatory parties is to have a need for focal groups to be actually developed within each of its signatory parties. So I'm hoping that this particular convention with its specific enshrining of the right to accessible technology will actually bring about tangible change. This is the last thing I want to mention is that I've carried out quite a lot of empirical work looking at website designers. What are their actual approaches to the notion of accessibility? And what you do find is a real fallback on normalcy. So designers are often able-bodied white males who perhaps have not got the end user in mind when they are designing these websites. And what I have found quite worryingly is a response that actually says, well, when you talk, when you talk about accessible design, you're thwarting our creativity. We want to design interactive sites that move and have colors. And actually, to have it be accessible, you're making it boring, in a sense. And I think that takes away a lot of um, the, the, the need for and the inclusive nature of the internet. Now, finally, what I would like to say is I'm doing quite a lot of work trying to push designers, governments, and particularly private businesses towards the need for accessible design. And one of the things I'm finding is that money talks in this area. In the EU, we have the Accessibility Act that's going through. Um, and also, a lot of the actual legislation linked to accessible design does not link to the general anti-discrimination poli policies and legislation provisions, but to the the internal market provisions. So the provisions which actually talk about buying and selling and making money. And there is a huge market. We're looking at about 80, 80 billion euros was actually estimated at the, at the market that disabled people have in order to, to buy services to, to, spend, to spend money in the European Union. And then at a private sector level, again, when there's been large scale redesigns of private sector sites, the traffic has gone up. People have spent more money on them. More people have actually engaged with them. And it's getting this message out to bring about change. It's what, that's what I'm here to talk about. Thank you, Catherine. That was terrific. Um, I'd like to now turn to Yulia Morinets. Thank you. 
could the speakers please speak directly into the microphone because the broadcast doesn't work very well when you move your head. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. I will try to do my best. <laughs> Good morning. Um, my name is Julia Morinitz. I'm with the organization Tech Together Against Cybercrime International. I would uh, speak from my, of course, from my area of expertise, from my perspective, from our perspective. So when we speak about um, uh, the, the rights of uh, marginalized vulnerable groups, of course, it's first of all the right uh, to access the Internet, and it was already und um, underlined um, by Konstantinos. But I would go even further, I think it's a right to access the information and the information in the language comprehensible to these groups. And here we have a question, of course, of uh, multilingualism. Uh, when I say the access, the, inform and the access to the information is the basic human right, we all know uh, this. It's a part of the Universal Convention on Human Rights, European Convention, uh, Convention on Human Rights. When I speak about the access to the information, I would say, uh, all Obviously, I speak uh, from, from our perspective. Access to the information on how to be safe and responsible online, because Internet and the ICTs will, and will bring and can bring great opportunities, specifically for marginalized vulnerable groups. But at the same time, and the example that was given by Konstantinos is, um, is a great one, I think, a boy in India um, using the Internet and the, the computer, but at the same time, I think he needs to have the information in the language comprehensible to, 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 to him on how to use safely the Internet, right? How to be safe and responsible at the same time. So I would like to, um, I wanted to bring this to the table. Now, um, how have we arrived to the area and why do we work on vulnerable groups, with vulnerable groups and marginalized groups? Um, this is because when we started to, we mainly work in the area in the field of cybercrime, cybersecurity, and child line protection. But when we started to work uh, being in the field, I would say, we just realized that the particular target group, marginalized people, vulnerable people, they simply don't know, they don't have the information, not because the information doesn't exist, but uh, they can't access the information uh, for different reasons on how to, to, to be and to stay uh, safe online. And they are fragile. They can be involved uh, or involuntarily involved in illegal activities online, can, be, can become easily victims of, uh, of um, illegal activities, of uh, cybercrime threats, and etc. And so we realized we need to do something with this. And afterwards we, we had a look and we, we said, you know, not only they don't have the information on how to stay safe and responsible online, but at the same time they are not uh, fully or not included at all in the information society. That we don't hear their voice uh, concerning the information society issues. And so we started uh, to work in the, um, in the field with this uh, initiative we discussed already during the um, last year and the year before, uh, the issue of vulnerable people or marginalized people and, uh, and ICTs and how to better include them in the information society and to have their voice to be heard. Um, so um, to be short, uh, when we speak about uh, rights, I would say it's from our perspective, it's a right to have the access to the information how to be safe and responsible uh, online um, by uh, using the ICTs because at the same time ICTs would offer and will offer great opportunities for this, for this target group. Um, what I would like to, to share with you now is a kind of uh, possible solution maybe because we believe working in the area of vulnerable or marginalized groups and ICTs that uh, we probably need a kind of strategy, national strategy on the inclusion or use of ICTs uh, by uh, and for marginalized vulnerable groups. So we um, somehow naturally, we had a discussion last year, a workshop during the IGF, and uh, we came out with the, uh, with the working group on vulnerable people in ICTs, which was created. And um, the group engaged to work on, the, uh, on a kind of recommendations for a, uh, for the, for a strategy uh, at, at national level for countries on how to better involve 
uh, vulnerable people in the information society and how ICTs can bring them new opportunities um, at the same time being safe online. So we will present this initiative this afternoon uh, at uh, half past two in this room. So please join us and we'll go more details. So my two cents for the moment to discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you, Yulia. Uh, we're now going to turn to Nadine Moawa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to speak a bit today about um, a different form of disadvantaged groups. Um, so the panel is talking a lot about technicality and access, uh, especially for people with disabilities. Um, I work on a program called Erotics, and I brought in some brochures uh, to give out if you're interested in learning more. So we are a project, part of the women's program in APC, that works on the intersections of sexuality and ICTs. And it's a very, it's a very interesting, very huge world to explore. One of the issues we keep trying to raise um, as feminists working on gender and the internet is that uh, these issues of disadvantage and of vulnerability are all intersectional, right? So we can't talk about one thing without talking about the other. We can't say women, and you've got rich women, you know, living in uh, Scandinavian countries, and you've got rural women living in uh, countries with a lot of poverty. Um, and you've got women who face particular disadvantage, and you've got women who, you know, kind of have access, can afford it, etc. So usually when we say women in ICT, a lot of people roll their eyes because they think, oh, well, my sister's on the internet all the time. You know, she has a smartphone and she's fine. Like, they only think of the women in their immediate circle. But what we want to talk about more than just women is gender, because gender is a component that we need to factor in when we're discussing access, geography, uh, limitations, vulnerabilities, security threats, openness, activism, who's using the internet, how is gender affecting that, right? So when we think also of people with disabilities, with hearing impairments or visual impairments or uh, lack of mobility access, you know, almost all the research always says that women with disabilities in particular face double the discrimination, right? Because they not only um, have to overcome the disabilities, but they're also women. So they're more inclined not to use uh, the technology or they're forced not to be, um, you know, as as mastering of the tools as, as men are. The same, t the same way that when we talk about uh, people without access who can't afford it, so where internet is super expensive, or where internet just, you know, there's no access, there's no infrastructure. In these communities as well, women will suffer more than the men. Because if the internet does come to some town or village, it will come first for the men and the brothers, and then for the sisters and the women, right? So that's when we talk about, when we talk about factoring gender in. Um, to, to add to that as well, uh, most of the work that we do is targeted spe specifically at uh, sexual minorities and sexual rights activists. So we look at people who are working on um, access to sexual and reproductive health and rights, uh, LGBT activists working on equality and justice for lesbian, gay, transgender, and bisexual communities around the world. We work on, with women working on access to safe and legal abortion. Uh, we work with uh, um, people, young people trying to put sex education content on the internet. Uh, and people trying to reimagine what does it mean to talk about sexuality. Because we always imagined, you know, the same way that the disability rights movement imagined that the internet would be such a breakthrough space, right, for people with disabilities. And that was the initial thinking. Um, and, you know, it's going to be awesome. But actually what happened is that people got left out because we didn't think about it as much. And it was the same for sexual rights activists. So in the 90s and 2000s, there was an explosion of people who wanted to talk about sex in ways that they couldn't talk about in offline spaces because of all the censorship and the regulation and the taboos. So they made use of things like anonymities and chat rooms and places to connect to sort of edge their way into public consciousness using the internet. And you see what it did for feminist movements and for gay rights movements and what a huge push uh, it gave those movements, mainly because of privacy and anonymity and, 
and the ability to, to really uh, have a battle from sort of a safe distance, um, arguing for sexual rights. So um, right now around the world, uh, we recently did a survey with sexual rights activists. And uh, when I hand these out to you, you'll see some of the results in the survey in here. We asked uh, close to 400 people from really everywhere in the globe um, about monitoring and regulation and, a and access and discrimination that they feel they face online. And there were uh, two kinds of discrimination. So there was the things that you face everywhere if you're gay, so, uh, or if you're, talk if you're a woman, young woman talking about sex or sexual rights. You face it everywhere, and you also face it on the internet. Um, and there were types of, of threats that were very particular to the internet and the sort of intrinsic to the technology. So the, the, the one stat that I find super interesting is that 99% of the people surveyed, uh, the sexual rights activists said that the internet is absolutely crucial to their work. Right? 99%. So you know, almost everybody. I don't know who that 1% is and why it's not crucial. But they said it's important to the work that they do, right? They can't do the work that they do without the Internet. And the work that they do is really important, right? Because they're helping, uh, they're getting, uh, you know, promoting health and promoting uh, human rights and promoting dignity for a lot of people around the world. Um, so if we recognize that the Internet is super important, we need to recognize that we want to eliminate all the discriminatory factors um, that sort of put these people at a disadvantage in accessing, but also in, in freedom of expression and talking about their issues and talking about their rights. Um, and Bishaka is with us, and maybe Bishaka, you can make a, a small uh, comment afterwards, um, because she runs a project that talks specifically about the intersection of sexuality and disability, because often we don't think of people with disabilities as you know, sexual beings or, or wanting to access information about sex or or any of that. Um, but to end, uh, you'll see in the results of the survey, and you can go to um, a website, and one of APC's websites is genderit.org, and read the full results and see the amount of people that have documented threatening messages, violent messages, stalking, cyberbullying, um, because of the type of the work that they do. And these are the things that we need to think of. How do we reduce them to give more empowerment and enable more people to use the Internet without discrimination? Great. Thank you, Nadine, for deepening and broadening the discussion. Uh, can we now turn to Jim Tobias remotely? Did we lose Jim Tobias? Oh, we lost him. Okay. Well, uh, now we're, go we're going to start. I'd like to thank the panelists for their opening comments and uh, just a mini sum up here, if, that's, if that makes sense. Um, I've, I'm hearing a lot of uh, issues of, uh, from Stuart, open access information, last mile delivery, and the role of libraries front and center. So we're hearing uh, expanding the issues as well as what roles uh, are important to address those issues. Uh, Constantinos, barriers, costs, as well as cultural barriers, and the need to break down those barriers and emphasizing the role of cooperation among the technical community and the private sector. Um, Catherine suggests the roles of policymakers uh, at the state level, at the uh, larger international level, and the role of designers as well, and, and of businesses. Um, we have the rights, uh, we listen to the role of advocacy and cooperation. And, and Nadine discussed the role of activists, and that was, that was terrific. So uh, let's open it up to uh, the audience for uh, direct questions to, uh, to direct panelists or to more than one panelist. And what we'll leave it, uh, we'll open it up and, and expand upon that. Thank you. So I'm going to be the wandering man with the microphone, I believe. Um, Robert, um, we did mention that in order to move some conclusions forward from this workshop, um, we might try something uh, a little bit interesting with the way that we approach this discussion session. Uh, yesterday we had a workshop where the panelists actually asked you questions um, in order to frame the debate 
as we go forward because that way we might actually get some, some concrete stuff. Now, you're not limited to these questions, but I've asked our panellists to think very quickly of a question that they would like to ask you in the context of this workshop so that when we get into this discussion, you're actually able to come back uh, and perhaps um, enlighten us on a couple of issues. Now, of course, if you have direct questions for the panellists, that's absolutely fine as well. But I'm going to start with Yulia very quickly. And do you have a question for the audience? Now, you might want to write these down. Do you, need, um, do you feel the need for the a kind of strategy at national level for the better inclusion of marginalized uh, groups and people with disabilities? Do you feel a need at the national and regional level for a strategy to include marginalised groups? And so you've got your hand up, so I'm going to come to you as soon as we've gone down the line here. Catherine? I'd like to know if anyone's got any suggestions for tangible measures that can bring about change in relation to inaccessible design and online discrimination. Thank you. So we have the internet. Uh, what can we do on top of that? in order to be able and assist people in getting access to it. I hope you're writing these all down. Oh, I need to repeat it. No, go on. Can, can you remember it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what can, what, we have the internet, so what can we do additionally in terms of tools, platforms, and incentives to uh, allow people to access it? What? Um, if you if you can identify a certain content related to sexuality that is censored or blocked or regulated in your context, what would you free up and what would you still want to sort of regulate? What do you think is harmful and what do you think should not be considered harmful? Well, that's an interesting one. So as we go into the discussion, it's traditional rules. It's introduce yourself and your organization and where you're from and then we'll get going. You, sir, and I have you next. Uh, hello, my name is Tarek Zaman. I am uh, here with ISIF and APNIC. Uh, I work with the University of Malaysia, Sarawak, uh, and we are working mainly with the rural and remote communities uh, in different parts of Malaysia. Uh, I would just like uh, to aid uh, some of the perspective from the indigenous communities uh, in this forum. Uh, and one of the main things that I would like to highlight is... Uh, that yes, the access is one of the issue, but their participation before giving them access to internet and to let them think about after the access what will happen or what are the strategies that they can come up with a sustainable access for the, for the future, future time. Why I would like to add this thing that the capacity building in terms of use of internet and ICT is, yes, this is important, but Normally, uh, the, IC, the internet, unfortunately, it is not yet free. These communities are oral in nature. Their communication with one another is oral, but with the internet and mobile technologies, it will come up with the money. And if they don't have any source of generating the money, it will make them more vulnerable uh, in terms of uh, many, and it will bring many issues. So. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I could see that access maybe uh, can be easily done and provided them with the technology, but their participation and to understand this whole eco, or I will call it a holistic system, where their participation is really important from the start till to the effective use of internet. Uh, and yes, the ICT can be, uh, an internet can be a good tool for them for a local innovation. Innovation, I doesn't mean only in terms of hardware system, but in terms of services, in terms of tourism services, in terms of multilingualism, whatever, in terms of traditional uh, uh, tools uh, and uh, stories, and uh, uh, I mean, there are different, there, there could be different, uh, different ways. So th this is only my two cents, thank you. So panellists uh, hold some of those thoughts because we'll come back to them and I think we'll take two questions or two comments here, then we'll go back to the panel and then we'll go over there. Thank you. I'm Jutta Kroll from the Digital Opportunities Foundation in Germany and I wanted to answer to two of the questions. First, with regards to accessibility, 
Um, we are following an, in a new project which is called Cloud for All, a new approach which is based on accessibility provided via the cloud, which means you can have your individual preferences all stored in the cloud and then when going to any device, like you, you're asking me, maybe your smartphone doesn't work, could you borrow mine? And then you get your, your individualized interface on my sw smartphone just when you start using it because it's coming from the cloud. And you can do that with any device. If you go to an ATM, for example, or a ticket machine anywhere in the world, then it could work. I have to say it's a research project, so it will take several years till we are there at that situation. But what we've learned from the first piloting sessions with people with disabilities is that it can work and it can be beneficial, especially for people with disabilities. And then it could be a step further with accessibility where we so far face like the problems you've, you've been describing for the Paralympics. Paralympics website. And then to the question from Julia Morenitz. Um, we are also running a project which is based on working with libraries all over Europe, which is called Digital Literacy 2.0. I've spread around some of these envelopes with an invitation to that project because um, the idea is that usually in libraries, people are, are going there to obtain information, but also there is kind of a threshold that especially disadvantaged groups in some of the European countries do not want to go to the library because of fear that they don't fulfill the expectation they have to bring in there. And so uh, it's trying to, to lower this threshold and telling people that with Web 2.0, with social media, it's so easy to get involved with the internet. You don't have to subscribe to, to long time taking courses or something like that. Just come in and try out these little steps to, to learn that the internet can play a role in your daily life even if you are a homeless person, for example. You can go to the library and have these little steps and that might be an easier way because people are reluctant to to commit themselves to courses or something like that. But if they had, have this small experience that it can really help them, then it might, their interest might grow and they might become motivated. Thank you. Yeah, uh, my name is Bishaka and I work with a nonprofit in Mumbai, India. And I actually wanted to comment on three of the questions. <laughs> okay, so one is the you know, the disability and strategy, actually. I wanted to link those. So we run a site called sexualityanddisability.org. And what I find interesting is that, you know, um, like we worked with a developer that specializes in making sites accessible to the disabled. But what I find interesting is that more people in India, at least, are making certain sites accessible to the disabled but they're not assuming that people with disabilities need to see everything, right, or need to access everything. So there's a little bit of a sort of divide there. And I certainly think that, and we do that too, we run a bunch of sites and still we started sexuality and disability. It didn't occur to us that we should also make our other sites accessible. So we are in the same boat, to be honest. The, to link it to strategy, I mean, I think it's a good idea to have some sort of strategies to include marginalized groups, but I think what's important is that those groups play a role in setting the strategy. And also sometimes what happens is, you know, I just got an email. Sometimes strategy becomes a sort of way for sort of a heavy funding push with very, very sort of short-term goals, right? So I just answered an email about a grant proposal, which is a six-month thing to work with cell phone operators to provide access to women. The truth is we have to, we said, no, we can't actually do this because there's no way we can even build up a relationship with a cell phone provider in six months, let alone show impact. So, you know, so strategy shouldn't sort of end up in sort of resources being 
spread around in this manner, which is actually not effective. And uh, also in terms of, I think the one really big hidden disadvantage is actually language. And so if you were to imagine the people who come to our sexuality and disability website, because it's in English, they can still sort of get some information, but think of the person who's disabled and speaks like, you know, the thousands of other languages that are there in India. Frankly, they have practically no information at all. So I think that's a big barrier. And finally, in answer to Nadine's question, I definitely think that we should really not rely on a policy framework that looks at pornography or sexual content as intrinsically harmful. I don't think it is. Okay, so let's go back to the panelists for uh, some reflections on, um, on what's been said so far, and then I'll come back to you in the garden. So, Catherine first, then Constantinos. Hi. Um, if I could just make a few points to link the, the two final questions there. I think a key issue and a key theme to, to look at here would be universal access. So, the actual scheme that you're talking about, excellent, cloud, cloud for all, brilliant. So, you, your settings are remembered, yeah, and then you can easier access the internet through your mobile device to any device. That's a fantastic initiative, but again, it's placing the onus on the end user rather than on the initial designers of the websites. Again, that's not really, that's quite a wide group as well. It's very difficult to regulate these. <coughs> While it's helpful, it would be much easier if the focus were coming from those producing the information and wanting to communicate the information and also not to see disability as a niche issue. Trying to see the world and online users as, as a community of individuals with many different characteristics and wanting to communicate information to get as far as possible, uh, penetrate as far as possible. I mean, tiny example, I've just spent quite a lot of time in the last month helping my 65-year-old auntie get used to her new smartphone. Yep. If the design were more intuitive, then she would be able to interact with it at a much easier level. Um, in many economies, we've got a population that's significantly aging. And again, there are key issues about access and exclusion in relation to, to design and, and how individuals can actually interact with the information and how it's presented. So a strong theme, I would say, was to get away from individual characteristics in relation to disability and just focus upon the need to communicate that information to as many people as possible. If it means telling people that they will earn more money if they do this, I'm actually getting quite cynical in my research now. That seems to be the way. I pushed anti-discrimination, the anti-discrimination agenda quite far, but now it seems to be if you design in this way, you will actually get more money from your website. Yeah. Yulia, I know you have to head off. Did you want to say something quickly before you leave? I actually have another question and <laughs> related to you just said something very interesting. My question would be, uh, how to make it, how to read the interest of the public or private sector, sorry, to actually design these websites um, and to show them, listen, you can even from the uh, commercial perspective be more successful by designing uh, and having this design. So it would be my question to the audience and uh, I would invite everybody to join us and to uh, half past two in this room to discuss uh, strategy or the need of the strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Yulia. Okay, Constantinos. Uh, thanks, uh, Stuart. So, uh, I'm very glad you brought up indigenous people. I think that, see, that's exactly what I'm talking about. We don't even have a very clear understanding of what we mean by disadvantaged people. Uh, so, we really need to start um, having a serious discussion about what it is that we are trying to achieve uh, even beyond that. Uh, but uh, I will go back to issues of uh, inclusion. Uh, so the, the disadvantaged, especially the disabled people, are saying nothing about us without us. And I don't think that there is a more uh, spot-on motto uh, on this, and we saw it very, very clearly. And I'm going to use, um, you know, we have the United Nations um, conventions on the right of persons with disabilities. First of all, there are many countries that haven't even signed or ratified the convention. Uh, but even beyond that, it is an issue of trying now to 
take regulation and take legal frameworks and ingrain them into the technology that is out there and enable the technology to actually go back uh, into this regulation. And we saw this actually happening, um, and I will go uh, to, uh, to, to the WIPO uh, negotiations relating to uh, the Treaty for the Visually Impaired Persons and Persons uh, with Print Disabilities that uh, myself and Stuart um, were attending. And I have to admit that it was disappointing, uh, to say the least. And it wasn't disappointing because we have a successful treaty, so we are, uh, 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 this is a fantastic outcome. But throughout these negotiations, uh, the, the, the disabled people uh, found it very, very difficult. Uh, there was find it very, very difficult to engage. And we were always talking to member states. And finally, it was at the very last minute, actually, that member states opened up and they actually heard, what are the tangible needs? That's what we're lacking. What are the tangible issues that a disadvantaged people, being disabled or otherwise, is facing on an every, on a day-to-day -day basis? I do not know, because I am not one of them but they are able to provide that input. And unless we create inclusive frameworks whereby we understand and we have a very, very clear picture of what those needs are, then we cannot proceed. Multilingualism, for example, is a very clear example, and it was mentioned. It took us a disappointing 20 plus years to introduce IDNs which is the internationalized domain names that everybody is able to write on their own script. Now, of course, we are there again, but it is very important that we start thinking when we are trying to understand the role of te the technology plays in our lives, that there are other people, that they need it more. So um, issues for uh, disadvantaged people should become default settings if you want in most of the cases they should really uh, uh, try to, to, to be ingrained into technology I will go I will take a step back from what you said yes web design is uh, important but governments should really start supporting uh, the creation of physical infrastructure in their own countries um, uh, IXPs is a very clear example internet exchange points that will make the traffic travel locally, which will mean that the costs will be much lower, which will also mean that people will have the opportunity to use the internet. And uh, as a very last point, uh, yes, we need to protect uh, how children and, uh, uh, you know, using my Indian example, uh, are using the internet. But for me, one of the key issues that the internet also has done is that it has enabled all of us uh, to also acquire some sort of filtering mechanisms. There is a vast amount of information there. Just we need to trust a little bit also the people that uh, are doing it, but in order for them to acquire those filtering mechanisms, they need to have access to the Internet, and I will stop there. Okay, so I know we have one more, at least one more question over here. Deirdre, is there any remote participants, uh, no questions at this point? Okay, so um, Imgarda, and then I've got Marianne afterwards. Thank you. I'm Emgarda Kaczynskaya Budabar from UNESCO. So, very interesting discussion, and I see the person who asked the question regarding the strategy is not here, but this is what I would like to comment, because uh, during the last few years, we carried out a number of uh, research projects around the world, and um, we analyzed five regions, and we looked how policies at top level influence the uh, inclusion of persons with disabilities. And we looked as well what kind of initiatives at bottom level are. And we observed that sometimes there is a policy but it's not really used, it's not very efficient, and there are many, uh, let's say, local uh, community-based initiatives which are more effective and we provide more benefits for persons with disabilities. So we try to understand what, what are the success factors and what are the challenges. And one of the things what replying to the question whether there is a need to have a national strategy, I would say yes, of course, uh, especially if country ratified UN Convention, it has to have some specific actions taken at national level, and even if it's not ratified, it still should have a national strategy. But one thing that is very important to take uh, into consideration, and this is what is one of our findings, what different ministries deal with disability issues, and if you really decide to formulate a national strategy, don't decide to do it only at, let's say, with uh, social inclusion ministry, 
only education or technology. But we observed, for example, there are a number of initiatives where um, there are good things done by Ministry of Social Affairs. And at the same time, Ministry of Education decides to purchase X number of PCs for classrooms. And uh, we could as observe as well that there are a lot of uh, specialized schools were shut down, were closed, so most of the children with disabilities who could go to mainstream education were now included, and we don't have assistive technologies. Teachers are not trained, and uh, normally it is much more cheaper to purchase assistive technologies if you really purchase together with everything else what you do. So these kind of things really reduce the benefits, and at the same time you could see that there is no coordination between ministries. It's the same as with uh, communication information ministries, which uh, basically are very keen to have, uh, you know, internet flourishing in the country, but the websites are not accessible, so public information is not accessible. So that is one of the po uh, findings what we, uh, what we discovered from different regions. It basically, it's more or less systematic, but our, uh, ministries do not work together, and usually those issues are dispersed among different ministries. I have one question, very specific question, is actually there is a need. We just finished a formulation of model policy for inclusive uh, ICTs in education. And um, UNESCO has um, top priority, gender equality. And I can tell you the truth, we were really short with data how women and men use ICTs in general terms differently. And uh, this policy model is very short in terms of gender equality. So if uh, there are any thoughts where we can find more, I would say, reliable data, reliable data, this is what I mean, not just anecdotal data, but reliable data, which could be used to enhance this policy, I would be very much uh, interested to hear it. So thank you. Thank you, Imgarda. So that's a very good question. Maybe Nadine, you might pick up on that in just a moment. Um, Imgarda, maybe you could also share, maybe tweet or send us an email the links to that study, uh, which would be very useful. Uh, on Friday, it will be one of the sessions where we'll be speaking more. So it is around 11 o'clock. So you are welcome to join us. Room 5. There's a plug for an additional session for those of you interested there. Marianne, I know that you, I'm sure you've got comments to make. And remember to introduce yourself. Yes, I will. Yes, um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marianne Franklin. I'm co-chair of the Internet Rights and Principles Coalition, which, of course, Stuart and uh, Robert are also involved with. Now, in terms of disabilities, this conversation is very important because in the Charter of Human Rights and Principles for the Internet, we have a clause 11, 13, which directly relates to the Convention of Rights of Disabled Persons. It is simply a beginning, but the thing is, my point here about the questions that we've been getting is, how can we be specific? And what tends to happen, it's about technology, the latest generation of computers, the latest generation of data storage or the cloud, being the answer to the problems. The problems are not technical. The problems are political, they're economic, and they're social. So we need to turn the conversation around just as the Charter tries to frame these very technical issues in a human rights perspective, quite specifically, not generally, we need to turn the conversation around. So my question back to the panel is, specifically examples of how you get technical communities talking to disabled groups. And to think that my mother at 82 is now disabled because she discovered when her operating system was upgraded that she couldn't find her Skype access, so now we can't talk to our mother. She's fed up, she says. She's a very, so you become disabled after a certain age? This is completely wrong. So how can we get the technical solutions thinking first the needs? How do you get techies to talk to the groups? And I think that's how do you get them to see that there are creative ways to design? And my point is there are people doing this, hackers are already creating tools and platforms to help disabled. And uh, come to our workshop tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yes, we're taking plugs for everyone's workshops as long as you ask questions and respond. Nadine, I wonder, do you, would you say anything to Imgarda's point and then maybe, Catherine, you might want to pick up Marianne's point. Yeah, I want to plug in our book launch over lunch. You know, I'm wondering, I don't know. Uh, 
I haven't thought of this question in a long time. How do men and women use the internet differently? I doubt that we would find any research, any hard sort of data that tells us something that that is not sort of like an essentialist approach, right? Because I don't think they use the internet differently. I think your gender um, results in you facing particular challenges of using the internet, right? And also intersectionality again, right? Always intersectionality. So it's not just, you're not only either a woman or a man, you're, you're socioeconomic class, you're able-bodiedness or not, you're sexuality, you're, where you're from, the global north, global south, etc. So, so we're all a lot of things. And I think what would be more interesting for me is to look at, and certainly the women's rights program at APC has, has done a lot of this research, and I'll be very happy to, to share it with, uh, with the, the UNESCO group working on this. Um, but it, it tells us things that I think are interesting in terms of removing the barriers and empowering the marginalized groups rather than what is intrinsic about it's for me it's like asking how do indonesians use the internet differently than i don't know people from switzerland like i don't think there's a different usage i just think there's a different challenges or, or access issues or something like that and we do have a, a launch of our watch a latest report over lunch if you'd like i think i've opened the floodgates with my uh, thing catherine uh, do you have anything to advertise or can you just ask a question? Sorry, I've got nothing to plug here. I might just answer some I'm completely fascinated by, by the point that was made here about different ministries taking different approaches. I did some quite early research about seven years ago on UK government departments and their approach to accessibility. And you are so right, it was the social and community departments that seemed to have policies in place and education. But then, bizarrely, and quite crucially, um, as was uh, then the, uh, the Business, Industry, and Skills Ministry, um, had very few set policies <laughs> in relation to, to access and inclusion. And obviously, that is a, a crucial area um, of, of the government's role as well. So again, it's, it's kind of reflecting this idea of, of disabilities as a niche a niche area that only needs to be addressed in, through certain particular measures, yet yeah, certain areas such as communities, yeah, social, social areas, rather than um, things such as even, even defence, um, industry, these kind of things. Um, looking at, at Marianne's point here, um, I'm quite in favour of using the law in order to actually take forward regulation, um, take forward, cha make change and take forward regulation and talk about turning the conversation around. Um, within the UK and quite a lot of EU member states, there has been a focus on trying to get in particular public sector websites to be accessible. And quite a lot of these policies, I know the UK does and Spain do, um, reference the W3C web content accessibility guidelines. And there are targets set, and there are um, different layers, levels that should be achieved, and still change is not happening. It is very, very difficult to get the designers, even within a arguably controllable sector, such as the public sector, to think about who is actually using their end product. They communicate the information and do not think about the end user. Quite often they rely upon technical testing using electronic tools to talk about accessibility and don't actually interact with, with disabled people. Now the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was actually drafted in a very innovative way and it had high level participation from groups of disabled people and this was part of its um, focus in drafting. Now at a UK level we've not actually put this into our specific legislation on accessibility. However, the Accessibility Act at a European level, which to be honest should have been passed in summer 2012 but is still stalling, has a strong focus on participation and people were, disabled people actually talking about experiences and feeding into the process of access. So I think that that's, that's a huge way of, of bringing about change, but it's not yet trickled down where I am in the, in the EU. It's not yet trickled down to, to the national policies, and, and it should. Um, 
just before I stop finish, I'd like to say thanks to Cynthia for, for your tweet about um, creativity versus accessibility, um, which was basically saying that if people can't be creative and accessible, then they're not very creative in the first place. Thank you. So I'm also a panellist here, so I'm going to take the liberty to jump in because I think some of the things that Imgarda said um, are things that we've been paying attention to in the, in the library community. Um, the kind of importance of the joined up thinking, the example you gave of some departments moving in one direction and, and others in another, certainly from the library's perspective, as we've wo moved through the whole WISIS process, um, and we remember back in 2003, 2005 with the sort of the heady rush of new technology and a, and a big kind of rush to find new things to implement the new technology. Um, we've always been slightly concerned that, that governments and policymakers weren't taking advantage of existing institutions. Um, and we've got over 330,000 public libraries worldwide. And you know, there was a slight rush at some point to bring in the telecenter movement, some of which has been very successful, others of which have had less sustainability. But this entire infrastructure of public libraries that exist within government budget lines and within existing policies really needs to be taken advantage of, particularly in relation to giving access to disadvantaged groups. And then just to pick up the, um, the point about data on, on how people use the internet, well, actually, in the libraries, people are coming in using the internet all the time, and we've had some very big studies um, over at the, uh, the University of Washington in Seattle has looked at public access to the internet through um, various sort of community institutions, and I think there's some data in there that you might find useful. But again, take advantage of existing institutions. If you're going to look into that information, maybe work with us and we can get you um, access to you know, any number of different uh, countries and different access points so that could be something to consider Constantinus I know that you had something else and I think we're going to be having to think about Robert's sum up at some point uh, Thanks Stuart v very briefly uh, reacting a little bit to what uh, Marianne asked about you know how, how can we raise awareness uh, at a political level uh, well that's the million dollar question really isn't it uh, so but um, a good starting point might be actually uh, to incorporate accessibility criteria in ICT uh, public procurement uh, processes. You know, doing so really encourages companies to that tender for, uh, for the supply of hardware and software to governments to offer products that are more uh, accessible for persons with disabilities in order as well to win, you know, contracts. Um, and the pioneer of this is actually the United States government. Uh, there is a section 508 uh, for guidelines for suppliers. The European Union also uh, is doing it. Um, and I know that this is not an all-inclusive solution. However, it's a very, very good start. And we need to encourage those. We need to make sure that governments, through public procurement, which are now part of almost of everything, uh, actually incorporate these uh, provisions on accessibility because then you incentivize companies in order to be able uh, and do that. Cheers. That's a very good point. We've still got a little bit of time if there's more questions in the audience, so we'll go over here. Hi, I'm uh, Niken from Indonesia, and uh, regarding to uh, the question about uh, how uh, women and men use ICT differently. I I used to do uh, research in telecenter in the rural setting in central Java. It, it is uh, a Muslim boarding school, and just a brief uh, uh, description about the 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 way they access uh, ICT, especially uh, the telecenter, is that. Uh, they use telecenter uh, differently uh, because uh, the telecenter located near the male uh, section of the boarding school. Because in boarding school, in Muslim boarding school, there are uh, boys and girls uh, section, and they are separated. And because the telecenter located near the male section, then they are more 
boys accessing the telecenter. And then the second, the telecenter have uh, uh, two separate room for uh, boys and girls. But in order for the girls to get into the girls section, they have to uh, pass the boys uh, section. And they don't want that. They are reluctant to pass the boys section. So actually what they need is they want uh, another door uh, so they can go directly to the uh, their section. And then the other thing is that uh, boys and um, uh, male users, uh, they usually directly go to the computer and just uh, by trial and error uh, uh, practice uh, and, and access the, the, the computer. But different to the girls because they usually want uh, the operator to explain about what, what is it used, how to use it, something like that. Uh, so they need to be uh, have uh, more explanation before they can use it because they are uh, afraid that they might uh, uh, break down the tool, something like that. Uh, that just a brief description because this is only uh, a part of the uh, finding of the uh, research. So I think. Um, Maybe in the future there are more research about this because it is also uh, about finding the cultural background that make them uh, behave like that. Thank you. That's great. Okay, all the hands are going up now when we're sort of running out of time. There's no. Oh, okay, so okay, so let's take all three very at once, very quickly, if you can, because we're running out of time. Uh, I, I feel that once again, as it is with most um, sessions at the IGF, I learned so many things and I realize how much I don't know. Um, a question that I have is, while I understand uh, the challenges for the visually impaired, um, I probably do not begin to understand uh, other um, disability groups and their special needs uh, on the Internet. And I think it might uh, benefit all in the general public if we did have a better understanding and this would help create a greater sensitivity. Um, so I am, I am wondering if there are resources uh, to which we as, as members of the general public um, can consult so we do get a better understanding of the challenges before us. Okay, one on resources. Hi. <coughs> Um, so my name is Cynthia. I'm a law student from Victoria, Canada, and I'm currently on exchange at the National University of Singapore. Um, so I have three things, and there are more points than questions. The first two are building on the designing for disability idea, where I actually just tweeted an article that I just happened to read about a month ago, and it, uh, is a, it addresses this issue exactly. Well, how do you get designers to design for disability. And two main points that I thought were really compelling from theirs, the first one is to get rid of the normative divide between who's disabled and who's not disabled. So for instance, I wear contact lenses. Does that mean I'm disabled because my sight isn't perfect, but because you can't see them, nobody reads it as being disabled. And even if you do have glasses, for instance, People now wear glasses even when they don't need them because they think it looks good or they think it's fashionable. So if you could kind of get that breakdown also happening for things like hearing aids or prosthetic devices, for instance, then that opens up a new world for designers and for the people who are consuming, who are using these devices. So for instance, on this article, they had a bunch of pictures of um, hearing aids that looked like jewelry, for instance. And then, so maybe if you held a contest, because sometimes people need to see something before they can believe it, right? So if you held a contest thing, who can design the prettiest disability devices, then that might be a way to get designers thinking about that. Um, the second, okay, so that was the first two points. And the last one was in terms of how men and women use the internet. There isn't, I don't know anything about data or of anything like that is out there, but just for information, on a more anecdotal level, there are a lot of articles out there online about people who have gone online um, as the other gender and then writing about the experiences that happened to them. And this goes back to what Nadine said about facing different challenges. So two specific cases that were more high profile was there was a blogger named James Chartran and he wrote a blog called Men With Pens. And it was a top, very high profile writing, blogging, 
blog. It was a blog about blogging <laughs> and writing. And then after years of this blog, James came out and said, I'm actually a woman. And this was just her pen name because, and then she detailed all the challenges that she faced in trying to become an established blogger online as a woman. And after she changed to a man, all the differences that happened afterwards. The other example is a video game, um, so a gamer who decided he and his wife both were um, very prolific expert gamers, and he decided to go on under his wife's account one day, and he just received an extraordinary amount of vitriol and hostility from the other players on his team, just by virtue of the fact that he was a woman. And then he, who is actually apparently a better player than he is, and then when he showed that he actually had, first of all, they were complaining because they thought, this player would bring the team down. Then when he showed that he was actually better than all of them under his wife's avatar, the vitriol actually got worse <laughs> because of that. And so it, it's not data in, the ter in terms of statistics, but it is definitely very revealing information that you could incorporate. <laughs> We're going to go to Deirdre, and then I think we'll go. I'll go back to Robert. How you want to handle the wrap-up? Thank you very much. I'm Deirdre Williams. I come from St Lucia in the West Indies, and I would like to identify myself as an end user because I think the end users are very often severely disadvantaged. Everybody forgets about them in a flood of technology. In this particular case. Um, I want to make uh, a plea for the fact that if you are remote, you are disabled. This morning, we had a remote participant. He was there, but it, it wouldn't work. I'm not trying to criticize the technical people who've been working really hard to make things happen, but surely if the internet can do anything, we keep talking about a global village. So remote shouldn't exist any longer. The person who is, I, I, I had a very dear friend who subsequently died. She had Lou Gehrig's disease, um, ALS. She was completely remote because she couldn't communicate at all except, blessedly, through a computer. I, I just wish that the, the things that the technology is most gifted to do, it could perhaps concentrate on and achieve. Thank you. Thanks. So, Robert, it's up to you how we spend the last few minutes. All right, great. Um, thank you, Deirdre. For that comment, um, I would like to be um, to be selfish and as well as inclusive at the same time, and I'd like to share some summary comments of all of the comments that I've heard, uh, response responses from the panelists, and um, and to synthesize it in a way that we can have some takeaway here. So, uh, just some in terms of some summary comments, um, we've been defining who is marginalized and how, what actors are needed to be part of the solution and strategies for moving forward. So first of all, defining and broadening the understanding of disadvantaged groups and informing the definition of inclusiveness uh, to include, for example, gender and sexual minorities, indigenous populations, oral communities, the homeless, youth, remote participants, and the elderly. Uh, identifying the role of users, uh, end users, as um, part important stakeholders to be involved from the ground up in discussions about and in research and in design of accessibility technology and policy. To, in order to identify tangible problems and solutions and to identify the needs, in Marianne's words. Uh, we also uh, have the notion in terms of strategy uh, or of understanding how these, these actors can work together is the notion of intersectionality that Nadine uh, offered. Uh, problems and solutions intersect among marginalized groups. And the solutions, uh, I want to emphasize, can intersect as well. Uh, and I think Stuart mentioned, ca called that joined up thinking. 
That was a term that was used. So we see the need for coordination between policymakers, ministries, designers, users, affected populations, and perhaps identifying the role of Internet governance to help coordinate this, as well as NGOs and research groups, technical communities, existing institutions, specifically libraries, and including disadvantaged end users as the most important stakeholders. To answer how you get technical communities, for example, how you get technical communities talking to disabled groups, or the future disabled, as Marianne pointed out. We are all future disabled. Um, ultimately, to make access and inclusiveness a default. Thank you. I forgot about the plug. Um, I'd like to see you all tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock in room 9 uh, to discuss the IRP Charter 2.0, Human Rights and Principles for the Internet in Practice. And this will be a book launch. Thank you very much. <laughs>